Welcome, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'm Roberta McLean, Project Manager, Practice and Policy at the Ontario Physiotherapy Association, or OPA. Hi, and I'm Rod Hamilton, Associate Registrar Policy at the College of Physiotherapists of Ontario, or the College for short. Thank you for joining us for part two of our joint webinar series, Practicing in the New Funding Model. This session focuses on understanding the expectations under the new funding model as related to the long-term care sector. As a reminder, the changes introduced by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care came into effect in August 2013 and affect the care delivery models in long-term care, retirement homes, and the community. Our goals today are to briefly review the changes in the funding model for physiotherapy provided in long-term care facilities, to discuss some common scenarios faced by physiotherapists working in long-term care facilities, and to answer some frequently asked questions and provide a forum for live questions about physiotherapy care provided in long-term care. We will spend the bulk of our time today answering your questions. Many of you have submitted questions in advance, and we thank you for taking the time to do so. If at any point during the presentation you have a question, please submit it through a question box on the computer screen. If we can't get to all your questions during the hour, don't worry. We will be posting responses on the OPA and college websites along with an archived copy, copy of this webinar. Before I introduce our panelist speakers, I'd like to ask you to complete our online poll. We will be asking this question again at the end of the webinar so that we can assess and improve on our communications. How confident are you that you understand and can apply the expectations of the new funding model in your practice? I'd also like to point out that if you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please click the help button under the video portion of your computer screen to be connected to technical support or email support at the streaming network.com. And now for our panel. We have Sherry Hughes, the Associate Registrar of Practice at the College, Dorian Sove, the Chief Executive Officer of the OPA, Shenda Tanchek, the, the College Registrar, and Jennifer Holstein, Director of Practice and Member Services at the OPA. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sherry to start us off. Thanks, Roberta. Most of you listening in will be quite familiar with the public interest role that the college plays and the professional advocacy role of the OPA. And while our organizations have some distinct differences, there are often times when the interests of the profession and the interests of the public overlap. Because what's good for the public is often good for physiotherapists too. That's when it makes sense for the OPA and the college to collaborate. And helping physiotherapists to understand and practice in, within the new funding model is a great example of this. Most of the changes to the funding model relate to how physiotherapists are paid. And they don't change physiotherapists' professional obligations to their patients. That's not to say that there are not challenges associated with implementing something new, and there are some additional reporting obligations for physiotherapists to report information to the Ministry of Health. During this session, we're going to do our very best to answer your questions. So let's start with a brief review of the changes that will impact the delivery of physiotherapy and long-term care. In the new model, long-term care homes will be receiving funding through their LINs to ensure that their long-term care residents have access to physiotherapy care and exercise classes. The amount of funding each home receives for physiotherapy services is based on a formula. The formula is $750 per bed. This is not an indication of the amount of physiotherapy care each resident is able to or expected to receive, but rather it's the formula used to calculate the total funding allocation provided to a home for physiotherapy care. Some residents will need more than $750, some will need much less, and some might not need any physiotherapy at all. A resident's need for physiotherapy will be assessed and determined by the multidisciplinary team, such as a physician, nurse, physiotherapist, and others. Once a resident has been identified as needing physiotherapy and is referred, physiotherapists will have the same professional obligations as in other practice settings. For example, you'll need to obtain a consent either from the resident or their substitute decision maker. You will need to conduct an assessment and in consultation with the resident or substitute decision maker, develop a treatment plan with goals to be met. You will then provide care 
and supervise support personnel if they're involved in care delivery and document that the care was delivered and collaborate with the other health care providers that are uh, in the home. You will then reassess at appropriate intervals, discharge from care when the goals have been met. This basically rounds out the list of general expectations. When care is provided using government funding, then there is also the requirement to report data that is specified by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Several sessions were held by the Ministry in January on these enhanced reporting requirements for the long-term care sector. And while the OPA and the College are aware of these obligations, if you have some specific questions, it's probably best to contact the Ministry of Health. Their email address is specialprojectreporting at ontario.ca. In addition to requiring that certain data be reported, the Ministry of Health has also determined a definition for funded physiotherapy in the long-term care sector. That definition appears on your screen, and I'm, I'm not going to read it to you, but what I will do is point out that it includes elements of assessment, diagnosis, and treatment in order to restore physical function, promote mobility, and prevent decline. Funded physiotherapy also includes activities such as charting, case conferences, collaborating with other professionals, discharge planning, and more when those activities are related to the provision of care to residents. Probably most importantly, the definition of funded physiotherapy, funded physiotherapy services um, has to be in accordance with the resident's plan of care and needs as assessed by the multi multidisciplinary team. It also needs to be at a level of complexity that requires the knowledge, skills, and judgment of a physiotherapist. Now, support personnel can be used to deliver care on behalf of a physiotherapist as long as that care is complex enough to need a physiotherapist to, to provide oversight and supervision and obviously that all standards are being met. Care should be discontinued <coughs> when the physiotherapist determines that the therapeutic objectives that were identified in the treatment plan have been achieved, or when further gains could be achieved through an exercise class or some other service that has been identified in the resident's plan of care. Treatment should also be dis discharged if there are no further gains that can be achieved through physiotherapy. Now more information on reporting requirements and definitions can be found at the Ministry website and that URL is health.gov.on.ca and the specific area you would include forward slash LSAA policies. One final change that may be, have an impact on how care is delivered is the deliberate separation of exercise classes and physiotherapy in long-term care. In the old model, Exercise classes may have been billed as physiotherapy when they were delivered by a PT or PTA, regardless of the level of complexity. Under this new model, that's not possible. Funded physiotherapy services must meet a defined therapeutic need and a level of complexity that requires, again, the knowledge, skills, and judgment of a physiotherapist. In addition to physiotherapy, there are exercise classes available in each long-term care home. All residents are eligible to attend these classes, and we'll be talking about the definition of these classes later in the presentation. They can self-refer to them or they can be referred by the multidisciplinary team, and there's no expectation or requirement that the classes be provided by a physiotherapist. This, um, all of this might not sound very simple, and it isn't in some cases and it is in others. So let's walk through a few scenarios to see how these changes may have an impact. And I'm going to turn it over to Shenda for our first scenario. Thanks, Dorianne. So let's talk about Mrs. Smith. She's 80, and until recently, she could walk to the dining hall independently with her cane. But last week, she fell getting out of bed. Fortunately, she didn't break anything, but the fall left Mrs. Smith with soft tissue injuries and a sore and swollen knee, and she hasn't been able to walk much farther than her bathroom since then. Now, you treated Mrs. Smith several months ago for back and neck pain, and you're pretty sure that she used up the $750 that were allotted for her care. What should you do? I want you to bear in mind 
that there are no minimums or maximums regarding the number of treatments that an individual resident can access. In fact, that figure of $750 is absolutely irrelevant to you as a practitioner. It's only the number used to calculate the funding allocation for the whole home. Think about it a bit like the public school system. Schools get funding based on the number of students they have enrolled. But if my child needed extra help at the beginning of the year, it wouldn't mean that she got cut off from teaching at Christmas time. Similarly, no individual resident has a maximum amount of physiotherapy available in a given year. However, unlike the students in a school who all require teaching, not every long-term care resident is going to require physiotherapy. So coming back now to Mrs. Smith. If the multidisciplinary team determined that she'll benefit from PT for her knee, then she qualifies for physiotherapy regardless of how much PT she's received in the past. Now, Rod, I think we had some related questions that were pre-submitted. Shall we go to those? Sure. We do have a couple of questions. Here's an example of one question that was asked. What if I have 50 residents like Mrs. Smith who need one-on-one -on -one physiotherapy care, but the home only provides time for 30 of those patients to receive care? That's always the trouble that a, a caring health professional faces in, in times of constraint, isn't it? The only answer to that is that you're going to need to develop a system to prioritize who's going to get care first. A second question that relates to that scenario is, can I use a PTA or a physiotherapy assistant to provide treatment to Mrs. Smith uh, and have that person do things like applying ice packs, doing range of motion exercises and strengthening exercises? So everything that we talk about today in the long-term care setting um, should lead you back to the conclusion that in terms of clinical treatment, there's nothing different going on. So wherever you could use PTAs in any other setting, you can use them here. Now the tricky part of that question, Rod, is I think that um, you would need to ask yourself whether the care that you were thinking of providing, ice packs, range of movement, actually qualified as physiotherapy in the long-term care setting remembering that care needs to be of a level of complexity to require that special knowledge, skills, and judgment that PTs have acquired. Jen, can we take a look at another scenario? Absolutely. Thanks, Shinda. I'd actually like to take a little bit of a look at physiotherapy as compared to exercise classes, both of which are separately funded within the new long-term care funding model. So let's talk about Kate. Kate's the new physiotherapist hired by Happy Valley Long-Term Care Home. And Sarah, the physiotherapist who was providing care in the old model, left Kate a detailed list of residents who were on her caseload and transferred all of the patient records over. So Kate reviews the charts and sees that some of the residents haven't really changed <coughs> over the last year. So it seems as though the residents attended physiotherapy treatment to go through a group exercise program led by assistants, with Sarah reassessing the residents quarterly. Now, Kate is on site at Happy Valley for only 15 hours per week. However, there are exercise classes provided daily. Kate is not sure if she should discharge anyone because she knows how valuable exercise can be to helping maintain independent mobility. So what should Kate do? Should she discharge the patients whose status has not changed? Should she continue the previous treatment plan even though the patients have not demonstrated any change over the last year? Or should she recommend the new exercise classes? What do you think, Shenda? Mm, thanks. So I think, first of all, that Kate's lucky to get such detailed charts from Sarah. So good work on Sarah's part. Um, but the next questions are really about clinical judgment, aren't they? You'd review the charts, and then you would reevaluate any, re any patients who haven't been recently assessed. Based on the assessment, the rate of progress, and the goals that had been previously set, Kate and the, and the, the resident should determine the best plan of care and set any new goals. Now some of the residents will have specific physiotherapy goals and the plan will be to continue physiotherapy treatment. Others will have needs that can be met equally well by attending the group exercise class. For that group of patients, Kate should discharge them from physiotherapy care. Now I understand and I agree that Kate thinks that every elderly resident can benefit from physiotherapy treatment to help maintain their current level of mobility and prevent decline in their physical abilities. Unfortunately, under the new funding model, everybody can't get physiotherapy all the time. 
So how can Kate decide who to keep on her caseload? The key questions to ask are whether the treatment that the client needs requires the knowledge, skills, and abilities of a PT to ensure that their physical health is maintained. Are those care needs of a level of complexity to require the professional skills of a physiotherapist? If the answer is that the patient needs some help, but not necessarily physical therapy, then Kate needs to ask whether the needs could be met through an exercise class. Jen. Now, exercise classes under this new funding model have a, a pretty specific definition. Um, they're defined as being planned, structured, and repetitive, and have as a final or an intermediate objective the improvement or maintenance of mobility and physical function, or the prevention of decline in physical function. Exercises are going to be provided in a group setting and are actually part of the recreational and social activities program, not the physiotherapy funding. Now, providers that can deliver these programs include both regulated and non-regulated health professionals. Kate doesn't need to provide a referral to these exercise classes. They're actually open to all of the residents. But she should document the need for exercise class in the resident's plan of care. Where a resident participates in an exercise class, the long-term care home is responsible for determining whether that class is appropriate for the resident and that the resident is able to participate safely. Ultimately, the long-term care home is responsible for a resident in any exercise class. It would also probably be helpful for Kate if she understands what exercise classes are available in the home. So some larger homes might implement different classes with different goals and outcomes. And Kate may be able to actually offer advice to her clients about which class would be best for them. Now, Roberta, I think we had some questions about those exercise classes as well that came in previously. Uh, yes, Jen, we did. Um, I'd like to read the first one. So it says, how can I reasonably discharge a resident from physiotherapy into an exercise program if I cannot monitor the resident's participation? So it's actually a question that we've heard a lot at the Ontario Physiotherapy Association. I'm sure the college has heard as well. <coughs> um, it's important to understand that if you think that the resident's goals can be met through group exercise, there does need to be a certain amount of trust that the exercise provider is going to meet those clients' needs. Um, so there's a certain amount of, of collaboration and understanding and a little bit of research that goes in there as well. Like we said before, it might help to find out a little bit more about those exercise classes and what the goals are. Um, it's also important to remember that there are other systems that monitor the status of each resident, like the RYNDS, for instance, um, and the healthcare team, the interprofessional healthcare team that can monitor those <coughs> and refer back to physiotherapy if necessary. So here's the second question that relates to exercise. Um, I don't know the qualifications of the program provider. How can I guarantee the patient's safety? Again, pretty common question, and I can understand that reticence as well. Um, again, the exercise classes can be offered by regulated or unregulated providers. Um, it's going to help to learn about what those classes are going to be. But ultimately, remember that it's the home, the long-term care home, that's responsible for um, the safety and eligibility of those residents within each program. And it's their responsibility to ensure that they participate safely. And I have one more question. Um, it reads, do I need to discharge the resident from physiotherapy treatment before they can participate in an exercise program? Well, luckily this one's an easy one and the answer is a resounding no. It's not an either or situation. The resident can participate both in the exercise classes and any physiotherapy treatment at the same time if necessary. So Sherry, why don't we move on to another scenario? Sure. Let's talk a little bit about assessments and reassessments and how often you should be performing reassessments on residents in a long-term care home. So Jim works for ABC Physiotherapy and was providing physiotherapy services to the Whispering Pines long-term care home under the old funding model. His employer had arranged with the home to have Jim reassess all residents on a quarterly basis as part of the service contract to assist with the home's requirement to collect and report the RIMDS data. So this included residents who were not receiving physiotherapy treatment. Now, Jim and ABC Physiotherapy were retained by Whispering Pines as the physiotherapy provider under the new funding model, but Jim is not sure whether he should be conducting the quarterly 
reassessments of all the residents. So first of all, under this new funding model, a physiotherapist should conduct a reassessment only on the residents that are under his or her care. And secondly, I want to point out that the frequency of reassessments should not be a scheduled event. It should be determined by patient need. You'll want to consider things like the acuity of the patient's condition and their rate of recovery in order to determine whether a reassessment is needed. So for, say for example, one of the residents fell while getting out of bed. This would be a scenario where a physiotherapy reassessment would be appropriate. Some of the other situations where an assessment or reassessment would be appropriate would include new admissions or where a new patient referrals requiring new treatment plans. Uh, a reassessment would be needed if there were a <coughs> change in the resident's status or if there were a change in the interventions being provided. You'll want to do a reassessment before you discharge your clients in order to show change. And you'll also want to complete a reassessment if you're going to transition them to another care provider or transfer them in, in one way or another. In terms of reporting, physiotherapists, I just want to say again, are only responsible for residents under their active care. So I'm going to turn things over to Dorianne now to talk a little bit about ADP assessments. So ADP assessments, or really mobility assessments that might lead to the prescription of a mobility device. So let's go back to Mrs. Smith who fell getting out of bed and hurt her knee. Prior to the fall, Mrs. Smith was using a cane to walk. And so during her recovery, you arrange for her to use a walker temporarily. After several weeks of treatment, you see that Mrs. Smith is unlikely for her to be able to return to the cane. And it's best for her to continue with the walker permanently. Mrs. Smith can e neither afford to purchase nor rent a walker long term, and both of you decide to apply for ADP funding for an assisted device. So there's several points that should be made here. The physiotherapist or other health professional is performing an assessment of the resident's condition and mobility impairments. This assessment may lead to the prescription of an assisted device, but it also might identify that an assisted device is not appropriate for this resident. Reframing our thinking from an ADP assessment to a mobility assessment, focus the attention on the resident and their needs rather than one particular funding option to access devices. ADP, or Assisted Device Program, is a funding program that provides financial assistance to Ontarians who need assisted devices such as walkers, wheelchairs, and hearing aids. To qualify for ADP, a comprehensive assessment is required, absolutely, to determine eligibility, but also to determine the need and to prescribe the appropriate device. The number of assistive devices in long-term care home far exceeds the number of devices that are approved for ADP funding. And this point is being made to highlight that ADP is only one way that people have been accessing assistive devices in the homes. So again, labeling this an ADP assessment is probably a misnomer. Some residents who basically are also responsible for 25% of the cost of the device under the ADP program might choose not to proceed with an ADP application. The responsibility of the physiotherapist is to complete the comprehensive assessment to determine a course of treatment, including determining if a mobility device is needed, and to facilitate access to that device within available resources including potentially accessing the ADP program should that be appropriate. If a mobility device is, is, introdu is introduced, regardless of how the funding was accessed to purchase or borrow it, the physiotherapist has a responsibility to follow up to ensure that it is appropriate and being used correctly and safely. Jen, why don't you take us through a scenario that illustrates that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, a new resident, Mr. Thompson, has been admitted to the home. So the team identifies that Mr. Thompson has difficulty getting around outside his room. They believe he may benefit from an assistive device to help him ambulate more easily and safely and determine that he should be referred for a physiotherapy assessment. There are a couple of possible outcomes here. I'm going to talk about one and, and Dorian, you're going to discuss another. So option A, 
The physiotherapist completes a full assessment, determining that Mr. Thompson has potential to improve his mobility and ambulation with a course of physiotherapy and an appropriate assistive device. The physiotherapist determines which device would meet Mr. Thompson's needs and be appropriate for the environment they'll be ambulating in. If Mr. Thompson is eligible and, as an ADP authorizer, the physiotherapist completes the forms for submission to the program, Mr. Thompson will choose a vendor from a list of ADP-approved vendors. The physiotherapist is responsible to ensure that Mr. Thompson is aware of any conflict of interest between the physiotherapist and any of those ADP vendors. The vendor's name will be submitted with the application form. Approval will be communicated to the vendor and authorizer, and then the physiotherapist will continue with the course of treatment and ensure that the appropriate follow-up regarding the mobility device is included in their plan of treatment. If we look at another scenario, a physiotherapist could determine that Mr. Thompson's mobility impairments and prognosis are such that he would require an additional level of a, a complexity or assessment and it may be a more complex assistive device such as a specialized seating system to meet his needs. The physiotherapist may have the competencies and skills to complete this assessment and only the physiotherapist knows whether they have the competencies and skills to do that individually and then they might proceed with the prescription of the device. The professions who can authorize these categories of devices under the ATP program are physiotherapists and occupational therapists. Should the physiotherapist not have the competencies or if he or she <laughs> identifies that a resident would benefit from a referral to another health professional with specialized expertise in this area, such as an occupational therapist, then the physiotherapist informs the home that the referral is required. The home is then responsible for facilitating access to the needed professional. The funding that is used to access this referral to other health professions is separate from the physiotherapy funding model in long-term care homes. We're going to turn our attention now to support personnel and Shenda. Okay, thanks Dorianne. Sherry, get ready. I'm going to set up the situation and you're going to answer the questions. Bill's a physiotherapist. His employer, ABC Physiotherapy, was awarded a contract to deliver physiotherapy care at Shady Acres, a long-term care facility. Two PTAs were hired by Shady Acres as full-time employees. The contract provides for Bill to be at the home 15 hours a week. The home and Bill's employer expect that Bill will use the 15 hours a week to assess residents identified as needing physio, develop their plans of care, participate in case conferences, and chart. Well, this doesn't leave much time for actual treatment. The home and the employer have indicated that they expect Bill to assign all the physiotherapy treatment to PTAs. The home also expects that the PTAs are going to run the exercise classes that will be available for all residents. So Bill wants you to answer a couple questions, Sherry. Should he assign treatment to a PTA he doesn't know and who's not employed by his own company? Is it appropriate to assign all the care to PTAs? Will he be accountable for the services delivered by the PTAs during the exercise programs? Okay, you're not going to make it easy on me. But I will say that these are concerns that the college and the OPA have heard from you, physiotherapists working in long-term care. And I have to point out that the college does have a standard for working with support personnel and a number of other resources available on the website. But turning to the questions, um, having different employers does not prevent Bill from being able to assign care to the PTAs that have been hired by the long-term care home. Bill will want to feel comfortable with the education, the training, and the experience of the PTAs before assigning any care to them. And if Bill is going to assign care to the PTAs, and be accountable for the care they provide, he must assess and be confident that they are competent to do so. He may even need to provide some training to those PTAs to be sure that they're able to safely and effectively do what he asks of them. It's also a requirement that Bill provide enough supervision for the PTAs. He'll need to monitor that they're carrying out the care as requested that the patient is responding as expected and that, that there's no misinterpretation or miscommunication. In return, the PTs are going to need a way to contact Bill when they have questions and to provide feedback about the care they have provided on his behalf. 
Think of the PTAs an ex as an extension of Bill's hands. The PTAs can only act as an extension if they and Bill can agree on what they're capable of, what they're permitted to do, if they can agree on, if they understand the tasks that Bill has assigned, and that they have a strong system of communicating with one another. In this circumstance, the PTAs have also been hired to provide exercise classes for all residents, regardless of whether they are receiving physiotherapy care. This is often a source of confusion. It's important for Bill, for the home, for the PTAs, and the patients to all understand that physiotherapy assistants are not acting as PTAs when they are delivering group exercise classes. In this instance, they are acting as exercise class instructors. I know it can seem like nitpicking, but I'm going to go back and just cover that piece one more time because I think it's really important that un everybody understands the roles. A person, no matter what their qualifications, is only acting as a physiotherapy assistant when they're doing things a physiotherapist assigned them to do and they're under the supervision of a physiotherapist. It doesn't matter what the qualifications of that individual are. If she moves over and now she's teaching exercise classes that are not part of the physiotherapist's treatment program, she's not acting as a PTA. In that case, she's wearing a different hat altogether. And of course, in that situation, the physiotherapist has nothing to do with the classes and no responsibility or accountability related to anything that happens there. That responsibility goes back to the home. I think we're going to have lots of questions related to this topic in the live question portion. So I'm going to move on now and just do a quick recap of some of the key points that we've heard about today. First of all, long-term care homes are responsible to ensure that residents have access to physiotherapy and exercise classes, and they get funding through the LINs to employ or contract with providers of these services. Not all residents will need physiotherapy. It's the multidisciplinary team in the home who will assess and determine the need. Once a resident has been identified as needing physio, PTs have the same professional obligations as they would in any other practice setting. You need consent, you need to assess, you need to develop a treatment plan, it has to have goals, you will reassess when the patient's needs demand that, and you will discharge and there will be good documentation throughout. Remember, the frequency of reassessments isn't determined by the calendar, it's determined by patient need. Treatment, in order to qualify as physiotherapy in the setting, needs to be at a level of complexity that it requires your special knowledge, skills, and judgment to perform. And of course, you can assign it to a PTA. When you do assign your, the treatment to support personnel or PTAs, you're required to ensure that they are competent, that you've properly and appropriately assigned the treatment, that you offer adequate supervision, and that there's lots of communication between you and the person who's acting in Sherry's words as your hands. Long-term care home staff are responsible to make sure that exercise classes are appropriate and safe for residents. The Ministry of Health expects the home and PEs to report specific information, but physiotherapists are expected to contribute to RIMDS only for those people who are under their active care. And when you need to know more information about your reporting requirements, the best place to go is to the uh, Ministry of Health. Change takes time, and the College and the Association are working together to make this transition better for the public and for physiotherapists. Please continue to visit our websites and the Ministry of Health website for further updates and additional resources. I will now turn it back to our moderators, Rod and Ma Roberta, who will be, have been compiling your questions. Thanks, Dorianne. Uh, so we have a number of questions here that were pre-submitted that we would like to now go through. Dorianne, I'm actually going to ask if you will um, answer the first one. The first one says, can physiotherapists provide treatment to a group of residents? 
Absolutely. As with all other settings, you can provide physiotherapy uh, to a group of residents at the same time. Uh, think of it similar to what you would see in a, a, a rehabilitation center where you have a gym and you bring uh, a whole bunch of residents or you know four or five residents to the same room to receive treatment at the same time. What's critical in this new funding model is that the focus is on one-on-one -on -one physiotherapy in the sense of an individualized physiotherapy treatment program. So you're going to have to, even in a group setting, ensure that you are moving forward on those individual goals and active um, treatments that, that are related to each individual patient. It's also critical to remember that when you're reporting the amount of time that you spent with the resident in treatment, that if you have four or five people in the gym at the same time, one doing exercise, another receiving treatment with, with you for a period of time and, and moving around the room that way, that you take the total amount of time, let's say a half hour, and you divide it by the number of residents that you were seeing at the same time. So that really is similar to the reporting mechanism under the workload measurement system that we see in hospitals and rehab centers. Thanks, Dorian. The next question I'm going to ask Jennifer to answer, if she may. Um, can physiotherapists refer residents to adult day programs run by a community agency at a long-term care home? That is a really specific question, Rod. Thank you. Um, there's actually a lot of really innovative programs that are being offered, um, adult day programs, and they run the gamut in terms of their locations from long-term care homes to hospitals, community centers, retirement homes. And the bottom line is each one of them is going to be unique and have their own eligibility requirements and um, referral processes. So my advice in this particular scenario would be to find out the, uh, the eligibility requirements and referral procedure for that specific program. Um, I'm afraid I can't be any more specific than that. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Sherry, I'd like to ask if you will answer the next question. If a resident requires ongoing physiotherapy care for a progressive illness, so for example Parkinson's disease, is that resident eligible for ongoing physiotherapy care within the new funding model to maintain, prevent, or manage pain? Yes. <laughs> if the physiotherapist's clinical judgment is that further gains could be achieved through physiotherapy treatment, then yes, the resident will qualify for funded physiotherapy services. So to clarify, treatment goals can include preventing functional decline. As long as the treatment it, that's required is of a complexity that requires the knowledge, skills, and judgment of a physiotherapist, and those goals cannot be met through group exercise. And I do want to point out that the Ministry of Health did add the goal of preventing functional decline onto the physiotherapy reporting matrix. Great, thank you. Um, I do have a follow-up question, and Shenda, I'll ask that you answer this one. Um, are we allowed to use one goal for six months or one year if we think that's the time required to achieve that goal? Thank you. Of course you are. This is a matter of your own professional judgment and it doesn't matter what the care setting is. You should assess your client, the resident, your patient, determine a primary goal or an outcome, discuss it with the resident or that person substitute decision maker, map out the treatment plan in the way that makes sense to you and your good judgment. The time frames will vary based on the goals that you have and the needs and expectations of your client. Thanks, Shenda. And I have another question for Jennifer. Are there any special reporting requirements in the long-term care setting? Absolutely. Um, we did actually, I know we said in the course of the presentation that um, for any questions around reporting requirements, check with the ministry. Um, but I can give you a little bit of an overview about um, what the physiotherapy reporting requirements are going to be. Um, I've written them down so I don't forget anything. Um, so specific to physiotherapy services, there are reports that are going to be submitted on a quarterly basis. Um, there's also a separate reporting requirement for uh, the exercise classes, but we'll focus on the physiotherapy requirements first. Um, so they're requiring quarterly reports from the homes, and the first report is actually due this Friday on the 31st, so I know there's a few of you out there that are scrambling to get your reporting finalized. 
Um, the rest of the uh, <coughs> quarterly reports are going to cover off a few things. It's all aggregated data that's submitted, and it's going to capture the number of residents who were receiving physiotherapy at the start of the reporting period, uh, the number of new admissions to physiotherapy, the number of discharges, the number of episodes of care provided. Now you should know that this has the same definition as in the Community Physiotherapy Clinic program. So it, it encompasses a total course of treatment. This isn't a single visit. Um, the number of discharged residents who met their treatment goal and the total number uh, minutes of physiotherapy care delivered. Now there's also reporting on the specific primary treatment goals of each resident and their primary condition for which they required physiotherapy services. Um, so I know we had a little bit of a discussion about what goes in there in terms of goals um, and whether they can be short term or long term and the ministry has agreed that the long term goal as the primary goal is the one that's preferred in terms of reporting. Thanks Jen. Shenda, I'm going to throw the next question to you again. Um, who determines who will provide physiotherapy in long-term care homes? That could be a hard question or it could be a really easy question. So if it's the really easy question, then the answer is the home makes that determination. It's the home's responsibility to make sure they have a physiotherapist to provide care. And they maybe will hire somebody as staff at the long-term care home, or maybe they'll bring someone in on a contract basis, or maybe they'll enter into a contract with another company that will provide the physiotherapy care. But if what you're asking me is, can the long-term care home, home tell you whether the care should be provided by a PTA or you, the physiotherapist, I'm going to tell you that difficult decision is going to be yours as a physiotherapist. And you're going to have to balance the competing needs of your clients and the demands on your time and you're going to have to ensure that you can meet our standards, which can be demanding. I know you need to know, though, whether the PTA is competent and everything else. If you're being told to assign care that you're not comfortable with, call us, first of all. Speak to the practice advisor here at the college about what you can do. But be prepared to say it's not safe and you can't do it. Thank you, Shenda. Now, Dorianne has been quiet for a moment or two, so we'll <laughs> ask her this one. Are physiotherapists required to reassess residents or code for MDS codes G3 and G4 if the resident is not on physiotherapy? Well, I guess I won't be talking very long because this one is a pretty easy statement, and we did mention this in the presentation itself, but you're not responsible to reassess or to uh, provide input into the MDS RI. Uh, Rye MDS, whichever way you want to go with that, um, if the patient isn't on your, your care list, if, if you're, they're not currently receiving physiotherapy. So the primary thing is, are they currently receiving physiotherapy from you? If they are receiving physiotherapy from you, then absolutely you should contribute your information to the Rye MDS evaluation of that client. Thanks, Ariane. Sherry, the next question is for you. Um, this question says, the definitions in the new funding model are based on the ICF model. Um, in the U.S. very recently, they have undergone changes as well for reporting under Medicare. Since I have also have a U.S. license, the changes implemented are, al are almost similar. My question is that what is being done to educate PTs about this? As you know, most of us completed our degrees in the 1990s. This is a big shift in focus and requires change of perspective, as most still do not get the concept of the episode of care. Okay, <laughs> thanks for that. I guess I wanna start with saying you're right. It is a big change and it is a shift in perspective. And that's why the college and the OPA are collaborating to provide these webinars to assist physiotherapist to understand the new model and practice within it. And I would add that each of our organizations has information on links on our website to, to be of assistance. And we are both very happy to take any calls or questions from physiotherapists. We really do want to, to help. Change, change takes time and learning comes from a variety of sources. So 
I would say that this kind of change, being as big as it is, requires the support and involvement of the profession as a whole. And there's going to be a lot of colleague to colleague mentoring that's needed. So I want to challenge each of you who are listening to, over the next couple of days, spend 5, 10, 15 minutes with a colleague who maybe couldn't attend um, and share what you've learned today. Uh, keep that learning going and, and be a support for each other. We're here for you, but be there for each other. Thanks, Sherry. I'd like to ask this question of Shenda. What are the similarities between the long-term care and community Ministry of Health funding models in terms of physiotherapists' roles and responsibilities? This feels a bit like a quiz show, actually. You're waiting <laughs> to see what question you're I can answer this one, though. The roles and responsibilities of physiotherapists are the same no matter what the practice setting. But what's different between the community care setting and the long-term care setting for this funding model is what qualifies for the funding or what's defined as physiotherapy. So we've talked a little bit about how in the long-term care setting, maintaining function or preventing decline in function fits within that uh, package of services that are defined as physiotherapy and eligible for funding. You won't find that in the community care setting. Maintenance isn't um, part of what will be funded as physiotherapy in community clinics. And the difference is the patient population. So in the long-term care home setting, a lot of thought was given to how can the, the special skill set of physiotherapists be best used to help this group of patients. And that accounts for the difference. So the funding model is structured similarly by looking to pockets of funding instead of pay per visit funding. The definition of physio is a little bit different depending on where you're working, but your job as a physiotherapist is just the same. I'd like to, sorry, if I could just add to that. I think too, what's important to note is that this is funding that has been specifically set aside for physiotherapy services as opposed to being put within a general budget of funding. Right. Thanks very much. Uh, Jen, I'm going <laughs> to throw this next one to you too. Yeah. Um, if a PT is running the exercise class for the long-term care home under the activation department and as an independent contractor with a large company, should they have liability insurance? Sorry, Roberta, just to clarify, did you say if the PT or the PTA is running an exercise class? Uh, the PTA is running the exercise okay, class. Okay, so, First of all, I would point out, as Sherry has several times already, that, <laughs> that um, if the PTA, no matter what their qualifications or what their education and background has been, is running an exercise class, they are technically an exercise instructor. They would be a PTA if they were, in fact, carrying out assigned treatment as per a physiotherapist. They are a physiotherapist assistant. When they're doing exercise classes, this is not the case. I'm sure that has been hammered home to all of the people that are listening now. Um, however, in the circumstances that um, you're describing, um, if they're contracted independently to provide those classes, it may very well be a good idea if they alone are responsible for, those, um, for the residents under their care, it may very well be a good idea for them to look into um, liability insurance and liability coverage for that. It's my turn to jump in on you, Jen. Love it. Just to say that if you're a physiotherapist, the law requires that you maintain personal liability protection. As another kind of care provider, such as a PTA or an exercise class instructor, there's no legal obligation to have that insurance. And this would be a good thing to talk over with the home or with your employer or with your lawyer. So you'll want to just double check what you need in that circumstance. Thank you, Shanda. And uh, Sherry, I'd like to ask you this question. For a severe Alzheimer's patient, if we don't have a goal, can we continue physiotherapy if the family wants physiotherapy for the resident? Oh, I, you may not like this answer, but I have to say that if there's no goal to be achieved, then there's no need for physiotherapy. And 
as tough as it's going to be, you're going to have to communicate that to the family. You're going to want to be sensitive and respectful, but if there's no goal, there's no need for treatment. E even if the family offers to pay, pay you privately and you accept, I don't think you should, but if you did, um, then you should not be leading them to believe that what they're getting is physiotherapy because the funding model specifically says that if there are goals to be met, then the resident qualifies for funded physiotherapy services. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, Dorianne, another question for you. How can people living outside of long-term care access exercise classes in the new funding system? So this is uh, another aspect of the funding um, uh, reform or, or activities that, that the government is now funding on, in the community. Separate from physiotherapy, there are exercise classes that are funded in the community. And right now, I think there's over, um, I think the last count was over 250 sites across the province now have uh, exercise programs funded in the community, accessible by those in the community. Some of them only accessible by those in particular retirement homes, and in others there's a more open, uh, broader eligibility to the rest of the community. And more and more of these are coming online um, week after week. I think the important thing to know is that in order to understand what services are available in your local area, um, by seniors is to go to the Lynn website and look at what they have posted, the eligibility requirements under those um, programs, and then um, uh, you know look at that from that perspective. There's no way that there's no um, standardized way of of uh, saying that everything is the same in every location. So it's really important to check your local Lynn as to what's available for you. And Dorianne, if I don't know which Lynn is mine, I think that I can go onto the website, put in my postal code. Is that right? That's correct. Absolutely. Um, and that's not, uh, if you haven't had to deal with uh, um, trying to locate services within your particular region using your local health integration network, that's probably your best bet is to put your postal code in because the lines and demarcations are not always self-evident. Thanks, Dorianne. Now, I'd like to direct this it sounds like a bit of a follow-up question to some comments that Sherry just made a moment ago. So let me um, address that question to her. The question is, I've been told by physiotherapists working in long-term care that patients must show improvement to get one-on-one -on -one treatment. When a patient has complex issues, the treatment may not improve the person's function but may instead prevent further issues from developing. With this in mind, um, is the person eligible for one-on-one -on -one physiotherapy? Yes. So preventing physical or functional decline is one of the uh, goals that have been included in the reporting framework. And so when you're doing your reporting, you can choose that as one of the goals. I think the trick probably is going to be um, a, being able to demonstrate um, that that goal is being met, that function's not declining. But if you use one of the, I'm assuming they're approved outcome measures, if you use one of the functional outcome measures and you're able to show that status is being maintained, uh, that would be one way to show that you are meeting that goal of preventing functional decline. I'm going to ask my, uh, my OPA colleagues whether they have anything that they wanted to add. I think uh, um, Shanti was just writing me a note that said that, you know, basically this is different than what we see in community clinics and absolutely maintenance or prevention of further decline of function is not a, a, a goal that is uh, part of the funded physiotherapy definition in, in the community. But it is in long-term care. It is a different patient, po a resident population. I've got to stop, make sure i got the right name here. But the, the other part to answer um, on Sherry's question is that you really do have to do an analysis as to whether the treatment that you have to provide in order to prevent decline is at the level of complexity that requires the skills, competencies, knowledge, judgment of a physiotherapist in order to either deliver that care or to um, uh, supervise somebody else to deliver that care. And if you can't meet that, then, then probably the 
absolutely these interventions would be helpful to prevent decline, but they might be part of their overall care plan and provided by another um, member of the team in the uh, long-term care home. So those are, I think, the important components to answer that question. I think that's a really good point that it's a team effort yeah. and you don't have to be the one who owns everything Absolutely. related to that patient's physical function. You could try a treatment holiday and have them go to an exercise class. That would be another way to show that the need for physiotherapy intervention. There's lots of different ways to tackle it. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, Shenda, I wonder if you'll uh, take a stab at this next one. Um, please provide clarification as to who can make a referral to physiotherapy in the long-term care setting. I think we might have reviewed this earlier, but, but we, just to go yeah, over it again. Thanks. We, we talked a lot about having um, the responsibility to determine whether a physio assessment is desirable is, is the multidisciplinary team's responsibility. So it, it shouldn't be hard, and there's no referral requirement in the funding mechanism. So I don't think we need to um, dwell on that question very much. One way or another, the patient or resident or client finds their way to an assessment by a physio. And if physiotherapy is required, the funding model um, establishes that it should be available to the resident. So. Again, the, the confusion, I think, arises because the rules are different depending on the setting. But in the long-term care home setting, the, the best rule is get that multidisciplinary referral and then assess. Dorian, you had something you want to add? Yeah, I think I mean, this is, is definitely a shift because in, in some cases in the old funding model, the contract between the service provider and the home uh, indicated that all residents would be assessed on admission. And that's just not the case with the new funding model. And I think there's really uh, an education to be done and a real opportunity f to, for physiotherapists to interact with that multidisciplinary team in the home and to help them uh, learn how to identify people that they should be flagging for the physiotherapist when they come in. Because absolutely, a physiotherapist in all likelihood will not be able to assess every new resident in the home. But the physiotherapist might have a, a quick consultation with the team members to say, you know, this is what we see. Um, is this something that physiotherapy could come in and, and assess? So there's a real opportunity here for physiotherapists to be able to speak to the value of physiotherapy in particular set situations mm -hmm. and making sure that they are able the team is able to identify correctly people that would be best referred to physio. Thanks, Dorian. Um, this will, as we grow short of time, this will probably be our last question. So perhaps, uh, Jennifer, you could take a stab at this one. Um, I'm looking for clarification on the following. I've received the MOA, MOH LTC documents on long-term care facilities. And I'm wondering whether there are any restrictions on the number of visits per week to provide direct care by either a PT or a support person. I was advised by my employer that only two, week, two visits per week are permitted. Can you comment on that? I think, and I, I've heard Shenda say this throughout this presentation, so I will repeat it again. There is absolutely no limitations on the number of visits or the length of time for an episode of care for a patient within long-term care. So the idea of incorporating a limitation of two visits per week is certainly not upheld by any definition of funded physiotherapy services that the ministry might have. But <laughs> <laughs> we're all trying to jump in there. I, I, I was just going to say that I think, I think the important element to that too is to be conscious about how many resources you have yeah. to be able to, do, to, to give care. And when you're prioritizing patients just the same way as you do in any other setting, you have to say, I have this many patients at this priority level, and in order to see them and for them to get the maximum benefit out of physiotherapy, these are the frequencies I need to provide for this treatment to be effective. And so, in a sense, there are going to be some variations between um, residents in terms of how many visits or the frequency of visits, but a blanket um, limitation of two visits per week is really not supported in this funding model. I think that we can underestimate the difficulty of the position that physiotherapists can find yeah. themselves in because if that was the expectation established by your employer, I would say to you part of your job as a res 
responsible professional care provider is to advocate for your patients. So if you believe that only physiotherapy care can help that patient to meet their goals, then you need to be able to talk to your employer about that. But I know I'm asking a lot to suggest that, and maybe we can help support you to get there. So call, call the college, call the practice advisor, call the OPA. If you find yourself in this kind of ethical tangle, we can't solve it for you, but we can be the coach or the ear, and we'd love to provide that support. Thanks, Shanda. And on that, uh, I think, uh, useful note, I think we'll probably draw the webinar to a conclusion. I'd like to thank you all for submitting so many questions. I wish Roberta and I could have asked them all, but they were uh, coming in very quickly, and uh, there's lots more that we could have responded to, but uh, we did choose the ones that we thought, we thought were useful. Um, I'd also like to thank you very much for attending today's webinar. We hope that you found it useful. And one further reminder, please don't forget to answer our poll question again before you disconnect. It's the same question that we asked at the beginning of the webinar, but we'd like you to answer it again. It's, um, after viewing the webinar, how confident are you that you can understand and apply the expectations of the new funding model? Uh, and by the way, if you joined late or if you want to refer this to somebody else, please note that an archived version of this webinar will be posted to the websites of both the OPA and the college. You can also provide feedback direct to the college by communicating us to us at communications at collegept.org. Thank you very much for attending.